Hey everybody, David here and welcome to the ASOG podcast. If you're an automotive industry professional or a shop owner yourself, then you are in the right place. This is a podcast created by shop owners for shop owners and anyone looking to peek into the mind of the everyday repair shop owner. Our conversations are more than just the highlight reels as we talk about the struggles and challenges we have every day and what we're trying to do about it. In our previous episode, we were joined by Jim Kokonis, a senior curriculum developer at CarQuest Technical Institute. We discussed the principles behind Six Sigma and the Toyota Way, and I found our conversation to be one of the most important we've had on the podcast. Now, typically we reserve the second portion of our conversations for our patrons, but I thought some of the things Jim had to say were too important to keep from everyone. So an apology is in order for our patrons. I'm very sorry, but I just had to share the entire conversation. If you haven't listened to episode 14, stop and listen to that first. Then come back to this episode for the second half. If you haven't already, make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. We're on every single one. If you're catching us on YouTube, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. We've uploaded some new content to the YouTube channel that you want to make sure you check out. Throw us a bone by giving us a sub and liking the video. It'll let others know about the work we're trying to do on the ASOG podcast and our YouTube channel. Now with all that out of the way, here we go. You know, I, I don't know what, what kind of a time frame you have here, but, uh, Oh, we have all the what, time you can need. What, what, <laughs> what is the, what is the difference in your mind between deductive, inductive and reductive reasoning? <laughs> Let's be, hold up. Let's be completely clear. I'm just going to go ahead and say this. David's going to have to answer this one because when you asked me that question a couple weeks ago, I went, Oh shit. <laughs> I mean, that. That's I, all I know f- deductive and inductive. Deductive means that it uh, necessarily follows from the premise. Inductive means it does not necessarily uh, uh, follow from the premise. Uh, you'll have to explain reductive. Okay, so the the way I think about it is deductive strips away everything that I know that is not the problem, leaving me with the things to look at. Inductive means I'm going to insert probabilities into the situation to analyze. Um, Reductive is almost what, um, (laughs) is, is, is almost what Lucas just did. Uh, (laughs) You want a fuel pump. Does it have gas? Okay. Reductive is using ridicule to, bring clarity to a situation and it's not yeah. very kind. It is rather humorous at times, but my it should not will tell be you, your I'm go-to. Great at it. Yeah. Gl- I kind of gathered that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm so I, good I at it a, though. <laughs> I used to have a manager that used to say he'd walk up to me and he did a lot of what you were talking about. He would walk up and, and say, explain to me why you did this. And, but one thing he would, you know, he would repeat over and over is break it down to the ridiculous, break it down to the absurd. Like I want the smallest detail here. Uh, I don't want you to skip any steps, essentially what he was saying, but I get what you're saying with the reductive. So like as a teacher in the right group with the right group of students, right? You, you give them a wiring diagram and here's a single fuse feeding six injectors. I have one code for one injector circuit. Um, and you ask the students, what's the first thing you would check? And they go, the fuse. <laughs> see, yeah. see, Lucas, is that you laughing there, buddy? Yeah. Did you just start chuckling yep. there? You, yeah. you instantly went to the... Um, McFly, you know, you, you, you want to go, how is this going to set a code for one of those injectors when it feeds all six, right? Mm -hmm. That's that, 
that's that reductive, like really, really <laughs> kind of, kind of thing. And so you want to reserve that one for the appropriate time and amongst friends and the ability to talk your way out of it. So just be cautious with it, but it, it, is, really, it is a technique. <laughs> I'm really glad my staff loves me as a, that's all I'm coming away from this with, you know, I'm, I'm really glad they love me. Did um, they buy you Christmas gifts? No, I bought them Christmas gifts. Um, I, I buy their love. I think that's, um, <laughs> that, I think that's, uh, that's, absolutely necessary i think you have to buy your staff christmas gifts but yeah i got eric a gas can (laughs) (laughs) why you gotta put the guy on blast like that (laughs) oh my goodness anyway (laughs) where were we (laughs) yeah no we were we were we were talking about we were talking about reasoning types and um you know we we talked about asking questions and seeking understanding. And I, and I think all of that stuff fits together. Um, and, and it really comes back to not everybody's answers are the same. Not everybody's techniques are the same. Um, I'll tell you one of the biggest lessons I ever had was we created an opportunity for people who are going to be doing some teaching to teach and they get to pick something simple. It could have been how to make a paper airplane, how to make hot chocolate the way you like it, something that they could teach another associate in a short period of time. And the only rules were that they had to follow a five-step teaching process. They had to be prepared. They had to tell them what they were going to teach them. They had to show them what they were going to teach them, breaking it down into chunks then they had to have the person do it and explain it back to them while they offered encouragement. And then they had to follow up, which means do it a couple more times. That was the process within the group, within the organization. And, and this is going to sound funny, but I learned some really wild things from observing that. So imagine two grown men. And one of them is trying to teach the other one how to tie their shoes. Now think about that. You would think that the workmate was just being difficult to make his teammate look like an idiot for fun. That was not the case. I sat there and I watched these guys like they were from two different cultures speaking two different languages And the student could not learn how to tie his shoes from these instructions. And finally, I said, which one of you is (laughs) left-handed? Was that the problem? You You got it. You got it right away. The underhand versus overhand versus southpaw technique was so foreign to the other person But David, it goes right back to what you did before. What was the end result? The guy could tie a bow tie on the end of his boots, but he didn't do it exactly like the other person did. Yep. Because his hands worked the other direction. And so there's all these lessons that if we do what you were talking about, Luke, is stop, slow down, take a step back. Ask better questions. Am I missing something? Have I set my expectations wrong? And then all of a sudden the world changes. And you're like, hey, I was going about that wrong. So to me, that's kind of like, that's my current lesson learned and, and something I try to do every day. And Lucas, you know, we're constantly being challenged to come up with new tools and techniques for the new environment with what we do now. Right. And it's been phenomenal what you've done to this point. I, I mean, it's been, I'm excited. I mean, we, we've been able to come up with and accomplish for people who aren't trained in that per se. Right. Um, the results have been phenomenal because we've developed a small team that is, very capable of challenging our paradigms and asking questions and going, I don't care how we've always done it. What can we do now? And it's been a lot of fun. 
So do you, do you teach this specifically as a class through CTI? Not yet. This guy named Lucas tells me that I should. <laughs> I've been begging for it, man. I'm telling you. I So you've got all, you're sitting on all this information, which is just killer stuff. And and they haven't tapped into it to to create an actual course. There's there's talk about doing it and I would like to do it. Um I I will I will put in personal request if I I I will I will start making. Hey, Lucas Underwood tomorrow. has some pull. I ain't so. got no pull with that bunch, but I will. <laughs> let me tell you what. I will beg Lucas, if I have to. I think that this could be done in a Zoom meeting with discussions with groups of 20, 30 guys. And you could yeah. probably set up some really killer conversations and thought exercises. Right. And. I think you can do this with technicians. Yep. Because if you take some of those exercises that we did live in class and we go, okay, guys, um, here's the vehicle. Here's how it works. Here's what it's doing. How would you approach it and why? And then have yep. conversations around what's the most efficient approach. Where can we go back and look at what we did do and say, that was a waste of time. Have you ever heard of Tim Wood? I've not, no. Okay, so that's in, in 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 lean and in stuff like that. Tim Wood is time, inventory, motion, waiting, overproduction, overprocessing, and defects. That spells out Tim Wood. And so you can take that into a shop and assess those are the types of waste you are trying to eliminate. So where can you eliminate time that's wasted? Where can you eliminate waiting that's wasted? What inventory should you have versus you shouldn't have so that you can eliminate the waste of inventory chokes? I should have had that filter in stock. Right. We do five of those a month. I can stock that filter. Um, you know, waiting. Why is the tech waiting? Do, can, is there anything we can do within the shop that eliminates waiting? Um, overproduction, overprocessing. So you would think about things like that in, I'm doing a break job and to do the break job well, and to eliminate noise complaints, there's certain things I need to do, certain things I need to get clean. Do I need it buffed to the shine of Apollo's armor? That would be overprocessing. Does that follow? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, that makes so you, sense. you know, how much do I clean up this intake manifold before I can put this engine back together? How much do I clean up these valve covers before I can put this job back together? Well, it's got to be clean enough to go back together clean and not have a defect in a leak. Anything beyond that, I'm overdoing it. Yeah. Right. So where do I learn that balance? So that's, that's where Tim Wood comes from. Another fascinating conversation. So, you know, <laughs> look, you, you've got the ear. You've got the ears of some of the best shop owners in the country. You've got the ears of some folks that truly influence our industry, right? Me and you have had many deep conversations about the problems in our industry. And I, I think you've really covered a lot of it in, in tonight's podcast. But if you were going to say three things, three, four things that you really wish every shop owner would take and, and could not only change their lives and their businesses, but would improve the lives of those technicians in the base, what would be your top three things? Be present, which means have your head in the game in front of you every day. If you can't be there, don't be there. All right. Um, the other one is challenge yourself. Challenge the questions you ask every time. Be willing to prove yourself wrong because that's how you'll grow. And two, it's okay to fail. Amen. You just learned a way not to do it. 
Amen. There's my three. I'm done. Fear, <laughs> fear of failure will stop you in your tracks. Absolutely. I was afraid to say that, but I went ahead and said it anyway. No, I, <laughs> sorry, you can edit I, I, that out too. <laughs> no, 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 that's no, fine. No, we, that's fine. We we, we leave it, we leave almost everything, and I'll I'll cut out the part you the part you wanted me to cut out. Let, let me ask you about goal setting. Do you do you have the discussion of goal setting as a necessary step to the process? Do you see it as a necessary step to the process? So it, for a technician, it, it, it is. Yeah. For a technician, it's my current condition is the a car that won't start. Yeah. <laughs> the the desired condition is a car that will start. The the process to get from here to there is an unknown territory. I'm going to follow the clues to get from point A to point B. Um. With the business and improving the business, you've got to have a goal. But it's got to be something that you can see. So, in other words, you know, and that's, I think this is why you see car count and, and, and invoice and all that stuff um, as metrics because they're goals. Sure. Um, for me, my goals were what's percentage of repeat business because I wanted to make sure that everybody I worked on came back and I, you you can't really even say everyone because what if they were just traveling through, I want them to want to come back. So the goal's still the same. Um, so, you know, I guess it, it depends on what you're shooting for. I was, I was very blessed with my shop to have about 85% repeat business. And I didn't have to advertise a lot because of that. But, you know, the process was how do I improve what I did every day? What am I always looking for something every day? And so that was my goal is I needed to find something every day that I could have done a little bit better or made a little bit more efficient or gotten a better result for the effort that I put in. That was how I looked at my day every day, if that makes any sense. Sure. And I think the without having, and this is what I was talking about earlier, is having those metrics. The, the metrics have to be based on some kind of goal that you said there has to be something that you measure uh, against uh, b- because if you don't have anything to start with, if you're not trying to get to an end result, th- the metrics only allow you to see if you're on the right course, but you've got to set that course. Uh, otherwise without that destination, you're just driving around aimlessly. And I think for a lot of shop owners, they end up with almost shallow goals they don't think any deeper past, well, I want to make a million dollars in gross revenue. I want to take home 20%. Okay, great. So what's, what's the goal behind that? What's the point of setting that particular goal? Why a million? Why not 950,000? Why not 1.1? What's the potential? And that, that's what we talked about in the AMA, AMA last night. One of the things that our guest pushes shop owners to think about is the potential within the business because they may be happy with if i hit fifty thousand dollars a month i'll I'll be happy i'll be making some money and the business will be doing well and i'm okay with that when the potential is there to do a hundred thousand well what could you achieve with a hundred thousand as opposed to fifty thousand so it's pushing that thought process past the obvious yeah, it's great to say you want to get into seven figures, but what is that going to afford you? I, I was talking to a shop owner uh, who was looking to buy an, another business. He was in a bad situation with a business partner. He didn't think he was going to be able to get out of the situation. And so he was looking to buy a another sh- a business and just leave the other one behind. Leave the other partner, just sign off on it and say, I'm out. And go run this other business, but 
he didn't have any clearly defined goals other than getting out of this current situation, um, which he could have done any other way besides buying a business. But he didn't have anything clearly defined. Like, what's, what kind of life are you trying to build? What's the purpose? Why a shop? Why not get a job? Why not do this as a career and not something else? Like think deeper past into those goals. And w- once you have those goals in place, now you can start, you have now a destination, start building that, that the course to get there, the, the track, start mapping it out. How is it that I'm going to achieve that? And, you know, this is going to end up coming out at the very start of the new year. And so, talk about goals a little bit do you see it as necessary is it something that's important um in the process does it provide an overview for everything you do Uh, talk about that a little bit you may not like my personal answer on this and i'm not saying that that goals are not a good thing because i think they absolutely are um you can't hit a target you can't see And so a goal has to be something personal to you. My only concern with goals is when the goal gets in the way of being present. Because if you are so focused on a goal, it can actually have a negative impact on the performance of the business or you being able to see an opportunity. Oh, that's interesting. Let me, let me expand. I know you guys are like, Oh boy, here he goes. Here he goes. No, no, this is good. This is good. Peak my interest. Go for it. (laughs) Um, so let me, let me give you manifestations of it that I have seen. I know that if I do a certain number of inspections a certain way in my business, um, that it helps drive the business toward the numbers I'm looking to achieve. I'm watching this metric, and I know that if we can hit this metric, it's going to move me in the direction that I want with my overall business performance. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so what ends up happening is you have some operation, like a specific operation that you want your service sales team putting on tickets because I know if I get this on X number of tickets, it's going to bring in X amount of work, okay? And so let's say you charge for a, a thorough vehicle inspection beyond a courtesy check. Let's say that's a function and you're going for a certain number of those. Okay. Well, you are incentivizing your service team to meet that goal with you, to push for that goal. And at the same time, what's happening is a customer comes in with a complaint of a charging or electrical system problem. And instead of properly selling, the electrical system diagnosis, you have them pushing for this goal and this metric that you have. And so they sell this service add-on that you have set as a goal for them to drive your metric, and they're not really paying attention to what the customer's asking for. So A, we have a missed opportunity to focus very specifically on the needs of our client. And secondly, we may have even created tensions within the shop because the technician is not being incentivized to do the work that the customer or the client has asked you for. And so the disconnect between the goal and what's best for the client is creating a schism and a, and a, and a almost a psychotic break in how the business performs. I've watched that happen in so many shops over the years as I've worked with them that it's just like pay attention to your client. So yes, I think goals are very important, but your (laughs) goals have to be, 
they have to be in harmony with with the core of your business philosophy. So to me, like so, so I, on, I loved what you, I loved. You just what pushed Devin, up the level, though. You just uh, uh, that you just you pushed it back further. You said, "Well, it's got to be aligned to the core uh, of your business philosophy." What business philosophy? Long term <laughs> ethical, long term ethical profit. Amen. Go. I like if, your goal, if your goal is long term ethical profit, period, full stop, and everything that you do, sell, market, and everything else. You know, people used to ask me, well, why don't you offer spring specials and all that stuff? And I said, why would I offer you a discount on something that somebody, one of my regular clients, just paid full price on? Yeah. You're, are you insinuating that my price is too high to start with? Yeah. Those are the kind of questions I used to ask myself. And I had customers and clients that were good enough to have those conversations with. And they would be uh, like, I hadn't really thought about it like that. That's what I, I, see in I like said. The new- I said, I would bundle. I said, if you come in for four different operations with the vehicle, I only have to pull it in once. I only have to test drive it once. I yeah. said, I will bundle and discount on that, those multiple service points. But I said, what's a discount? <laughs> so, yeah. so long-term ethical profit. It's well, gotta I, be, I it's gotta be fair for everybody. The, the new customer specials drive me bananas for that exact reason. There you go. And seeing somebody give a brand new customer that they've never met. They don't know anything about a discount over the loyal customer that's showing up three to four times a year with both their vehicles. They don't get the discount, but that person right off the street got on the website, pl- printed the coupon and they walked right in and they got the discount for whatever reason, because yeah. I, I get it. You're trying to acquire them as a customer, but where's the, lo- where's the loyalty? Where's the you, incentive you ever heard to the, be loyal? You ever heard the story of the butcher, the, the local butcher, you know, he, he do everybody. And when they came in and they'd ask for a pound of ground beef, right. And he clearly put a pound and an eighth, a pound and a quarter of ground beef on the scale and sold it to him for a pound. So there's your pound of ground beef and winked at him. That was his discount. It was a bonus, a thank you. Mm-hmm. And, and those kind of stories stuck with me is, you know, if you're going to say thank you, say thank you. Give them something yeah. of value. And if not, if what you gave them had value, they don't expect anything different because you delivered exactly what you had the agreement. We talked about relationships early on. Um, relationships are bank accounts. Doesn't matter if it's employees, customers, vendors, Amen. they're bank accounts. If you make enough deposits of positive value, the bank account is strong. If you make enough withdrawals, (laughs) it goes belly up. So anyway, well, you know, I sound sound like I'm pontificating and I need to stop that. Well, look, you know, you bring up something that we've talked about over and over again and, and something that really created this kind of fear for me when it came to hiring my new advisor. And it is, it comes back to, Seek first to understand. Understand what does your customer or your client want? What do they need? Right? We're the professionals. We're supposed to lead and guide them. We have to understand what it is they're looking for so we can meet their need, right? And and you know, this last advisor, I, I've hired some advisors and and I'm not saying that other folks that I've had weren't doing a good job, but they weren't the fit that I was looking for. And the experience I had with this advisor that I've just hired. Um, I said, so he's working in a tractor dealership. They repair big agricultural equipment. They repair little tractors, all kinds of stuff. And I said, um, so tell me, uh, my tractor's oil pan's leaking. Uh, how would you sell it to me? And he said, Mr. Underwood, he said, I couldn't sell you that until I understood what you did with your tractor. And I said, <laughs> okay, why? He said, well, because if I don't know how you're using your tractor and I don't know what you're using your tractor for, I can't understand what's best for you. And I thought, now I like the way this guy thinks, right? And, And that kind of spoke to me that all too often 
we leave the professional element of our industry on the table, right? We fix their car, but we're leaving the professional element on the table. That is that I don't go to the doctor and have a problem and expect the doctor to tell me what I want to hear or give me the price that I want to fix something. I go to the doctor because he's a professional and I expect him to tell me what I need to do. He needs to guide me. He needs to lead me where I need to go. And I think that's something as an industry we've left on the table for far too long. I'm not saying that we shouldn't go in the direction the client wants us to go. Not not saying we shouldn't fix the issues that they have. Understand those issues. And with that understanding, lead and guide your client in the direction we need to go. That's a scene from uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Have you seen that movie yet, Lucas? No, listen, on the I, list, have, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I have been the <laughs> There's advisor a scene where the guy is handing, he, he, he's in a room, he's doing motivational speaking or whatever. And he hands the guy in front of him and he said, sell me this pen. And the guy starts talking about the pen and he's like, Oh, look at this great pen. It's, you know, it clicks and this, that, and the other. And he shakes his head, grabs the pen, hands it to the next guy and says, sell me this pen. And this, the guy does the same thing. And the point is. That and and I don't think they he said he talks about it in the book, but I don't think they they give the answer in the movie. I can't remember. Um, the, the 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 correct way to sell the pen is to ask, "Do you even need this pen? Tell me about your business. What are you in? What do you do? Are you even going to need this pen?" And that's the point of it is that that approach. Ask the questions first. Find out if you even need the pen. Because if you're going to try to sell this guy this pen, he may not even need a pen. What's the point? Exactly. Exactly. You try and sell a man something he will never use or he will never need. And one of you is going to leave that interaction a fool. Except, see, I agree with everything you guys are saying. And I think it's spot on. But what are the jokes that you constantly hear? This guy could sell a refrigerator to somebody up in the Arctic Circle. Okay. Yeah, ice and Eskimo, sure. The ice and the Eskimo, whatever. Okay. And that's considered the consummate salesman, and that's the problem. Because yeah. I think the same kind of things apply to the consummate CPA. The, you know, the, the con- <laughs> and they all come out of the same schools, and they're all looking for the same things, and everybody's saying it's not working. So what's the answer to that? And that's my, that's my question to you guys. You're going to have to tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. One interaction at a time. How about that's all you can do? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, I got to tell you guys, I've got, um, I've got a pity out here that's uh, given me grief because I haven't taken care of his needs. So if you guys have anything else for me, I'd be happy to entertain it. I'd love to get some feedback from this and have maybe another conversation. Absolutely. No, this, is gonna be, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to hype the yeah. crap out of this episode. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> look every, every, and, and I told David this, I said, look, this guy is somebody that I rely heavily on when it comes to making decisions. And, and, and I'm serious. You, you really changed my whole thought process in the shop. You made my shop better um, through the advice you oh, gave I, me. So thank you. I'm, I'm glad you got some value out of it. And, and I love, I love the opportunity to sit and listen to guys that are successful and passionate. Um, and then me, no, 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 no. David, it's been a pleasure. I, you know, I, I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to speak more in the future. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the ASOG podcast. If you've enjoyed listening to the second half of our conversation with Jim, consider becoming a patron yourself. All access membership is $6 a month and your contribution goes to the ASOG fund, a 501c3 educational nonprofit organization, which means your contributions are tax deductible. Just head on over to our website, asog.site, that's A-S-O-G dot S-I-T-E, and click on the Become a Patron Now button. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. It helps spread the word. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and hitting that like button. 
The like button keeps entering Lucas's email addresses on spam sites, and it's flooding his inbox with sketchy junk mail. Hit that like button with force and vigor and stop them for good. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, or if you have any topic suggestions, please reach out to me via email. My email address is david at asog.site. That's D-A-V-I-D at A-S-O-G dot S-I-T-E. Until next time. 